Thank you very much, Sam. Very difficult to, to be the last person to speak after a wonderful day of incredible wisdom. And uh, thank you very much to my peers on this panel um, for, for the wisdom that you make it very difficult for me to now step on the pedestal and, and attempt to share a bit of wisdom of, of my own. So we're here today to talk about financing the SDGs. And I think this is actually the starting point for perhaps how we even need to speak differently about this very important subject. It's hard. It's hard to finance. It's hard to be fundraising, especially those of us in organizations, in, in governments that are constantly fundraising um, because they do not, we do not have the necessary budgets and GDP um, to, to fund, to finance our own national projects. And it's hard for any local startup organization, whether it's an NGO, um, a, uh, a business, or a members network. So why is it hard? At Nexus, I'm the Emeritus Director for um, the MENA region and Arab diasporas. <laughs> so, assalamu <laughs> alaikum. And at Nexus, what, I, what really compels me to be part of this movement is because we are a safe space that asks really tough questions, the, the uncomfortable questions. But at the end of the day, every convening that we have as Nexus is a center of gravity for honesty and the necessity of confession, that even our understanding of good, frankly, might not be good enough. So we operate in a world today where targets are so significant, the targets of the SDGs, the targets of global humanity at large. Good is not good enough to achieve those targets because we need greatness. And so greatness starts with an honesty check. And so I want to spend the few minutes that I have with you to ask a couple of tough questions, but also propose the starting point for some answers. My first question is, have the sustainability development goals even made it easier for us to mobilize capital? Or frankly, has it become even harder? You see, the SDGs we know is a framework. It's a starting point to instigate thought and precise assessment on what our world needs today. And it is a framework that is attempting to really look at the deficiencies in humanity around us, and frankly, what stops us short from being fundamentally, holistically human. But when we look at the concept of raising funds for the SDGs, I think we need to take a step back and replace the word financing with the word capitalization. My business peers next to me would understand what I'm referring to. Because when we talk about capital, it's no longer just about money. It is about intelligent, thoughtful, smart money that is in partnership with other forms of capital. Social capital, political capital, intelligence as capital, and governance as capital. And so I encourage us to really take that step back and let's not get bogged down by the conversation of fundraising and financing, and instead really look at the, 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 the challenges in front of us from a perspective of how can I bring the smartest capital to the table. I'd like to use a case study that I have worked on over the last four years just as a very, very quick example so that I am not staying in the stratosphere of theory with you. One of the things that I did a few years ago after co-founding one of our family businesses in Lebanon and Saudi Arabia was to launch our family's philanthropic portfolio. 
And we've only had one very specific crisis, crisis that we have been responding to, and that is the cause of the Yazidi in Iraq. And I won't go into the how and the why, but I'd, I always love to talk about it, so please do catch me after this session, because I won't stop talking. <laughs> but w why do I want to talk about the Yazidis? Because they are a community that's quite entrepreneurial. Some of the members of the community are quite entrepreneurial, and they happened to be friends. And when this all really cascaded, and Daesh militants entered Sinjar, and began to pillage villages, and, and grab women and girls, and place them in trucks, and send them off to their sex slavery marketplaces, the community had too many things that they, needed to, that they needed to start working towards. There were too many priorities. And so the big question was, what is our starting point? How are we going to begin? And where do we even begin to begin with? And so one of the things that I began to do was run prototypes with the community. At a time when no EU government wanted to be on the ground, there was barely any presence of the United Nations. It was early stages in 2015, only six months after the invasion of Sinjar and what I, with the community, eventually reclassified as genocide. I began to run prototypes with the community to try to alleviate important pressures with girls returning back in outrageous conditions with refugee families, IDP families, now living in camps with no access to medical supplies. And what they now required were immediate, super top class medical intervention if you wanted to effect any positive change. And you'd suspect that in that type of environment, you would need hundreds of millions and millions of dollars of smart capital to to really start to interject and intervene. But in fact, we only had to spend several tens and tens of thousands of dollars where we began to put in place spiritual pilgrimages for girls and women who needed, upon returning to their home, which was now a disturbed IDP camp, it was no longer a home, to get these girls to re-enter their communities with open arms. And so we started not with survivor programs, but rather a spiritual pilgrimage with the Pope of the Ezidi religion, Baba Sheikh. And we brought these girls in for a reconversion ceremony, for a welcome back home ceremony. And before bringing each girl and woman back to her house or her tent, depending on the situation of her family, we equipped her with gifts. We knew she was a gift going back to her family, but what we did is we spent a few thousand dollars per girl, per woman, to cover food staples, staples, clothes, cash for medical um, consultations, and transportation. And we got that right a few times until a couple of international organizations stepped in and financed or capitalized the pilot with hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so then that prototype, that pilot was successful and we moved on to the next and the next and the next. My point is, as financiers, as philanthropists, and as social investors, we need to do a better job of understanding where do we fit in the equation. I'm not an international human, humanitarian aid agency. I don't get to think in terms of emergency response and funnel millions of dollars. I am an entrepreneur and a philanthropist, but I'm an individual, I'm a human being. And so I need to understand how to make my money smart. But the reason that it ended up having the multiplier effect that it did was because my Yazidi friends ended up educating me and inspiring me, and not letting a day go by without really bringing, bringing a lot of tangibility to their challenges. And I gained ownership because of it. And as I always tell my Yazidi friends, the Armenian in me woke up for the very first time. And it made so much sense that yes, we are going through genocide 
together. Because when humanity is affected, one community is affected, all of humanity is hurt as a consequence. And so we need capital to not be finance. We need it to be intelligent. And it is not just about you pitching to us what needs to be done, but us getting a lot smarter of how we need to be recipients of that information and do something about it. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. So we'd now like to...